we've got the special privilege of having with us Mr. Danny Gilbert, AM managing partner and co-founder of Gilbert and Tobin. Danny, you've had a, an extraordinary career. We'll unpack all of that. But before we do, I thought we'd start with your background. You grew up just outside Griffith in southwestern New South Wales. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, if you could. Oh, well, um, I'm the oldest of six. I grew up on a, a soldier settlement block. You know what they are. I thought it was a small irrigation block about 20 miles west of Griffith. So I've got a farming background. My father also bought other properties around the place. So I grew up with a good experience as a young fellow on a farm and learned the value of hard work and getting up early and milking the cow, all that sort of things, yeah. And your parents, what did they do and, and what sort of impact did they have on you? Well, they were sort of farmers, just sort of regular country people, I would say, good-hearted people. And uh, again, the value of, uh, value of hard work. Uh, my mother was a very uh, committed Catholic and at 96 still is. My father was a very committed atheist, so that was <laughs> an interesting mix. <laughs> Would have made some interesting table discussions. Uh, oh, well, never kind of got to the sort of table discussions. <laughs> it was just under the surface, I think. So we're talking about growing up on a farm in, in 1960s Australia, 50s Australia. What was, 50s and 60s. What was Australia like at, at that time, and particularly the area that you were growing up in? Gee, um, what was it like then? It's hard to remember these things. I mean, Griffith was a small town. It was just sort of emerging into the wealthy town it is today. There was a big uh, migrant Italian community coming into the place. Uh, well, you know, in the early 1950s, it's not that long after the Second World War, really, and people were recovering their lives from that, I think, and finding their, finding their feet and establish them, establishing themselves. And I think were, you know, very focused on, on their families and getting ahead. It wasn't a rich area, <clears throat> it has become one. You know, real, really quite sort of conservative, but not in an establishment way. It wasn't an area where, you know, there were a lot of landed gentry types. There were a lot of people who'd come there, didn't have much, and were building lives for themselves. Because that's how the irrigation area actually developed with people like that. And uh, as I say, a lot of people from Europe, mainly Italians, and they uh, have been incredibly successful and made a huge con contribution to the, to the uh, lifestyle and uh, wealth of that area. From there, I want to ask you about Danny Gilbert as a student. If I recall correctly, a, a teacher suggested that the law might be a, an opportunistic career pathway for you to pursue. What were you like as a student? Oh, look, I, I, wouldn't, I would say I was sort of a better than average student. I don't know that I put it that much higher than that. I was uh, pretty keen to do okay without having any particular objective in front of me. I'd, by the time I was sort of nearly finished school, I'd formed a view that I didn't think I really wanted to be a farmer. I remember talking to a teacher about it one day and he was very specific. He said, you should uh, go to Sydney University and you should study law. So I said, oh, I'll do that. <laughs> and I got in and yeah, that's, yeah, so that's how I made my way. Yeah. without knowing anything about the practice of law at all. And your experiences at the University of, of Sydney and your first encounter with the law, what was that like? Very mysterious. Uh, you know, I did straight law. Many of the people who were there were doing combined degrees. I didn't really know even that you could do a combined degree. I don't think I was very well versed. I think I was just sort of thrown into the deep end uh, by my education and uh, by my family really, they had no idea and um, they just sort of, my recollection is, they sort of stood on the sidelines and <laughs> watched what I did. And uh, so it was all very foreign to me, it was a very new experience. Going from the classroom to the university lecture style things, but anyway, I, I got by, got the swing of it after a while. I lived in college, but, so that was good, I made a lot of friends in college. So you graduate the University of Sydney and, and what happens next? Well, I then, um, while I was studying, had a job in a small firm and then I went to a more of an establishment firm for a year or so. And I thought at that point I might like to go back and be a, a country solicitor. So I went back to Griffith uh, with my then wife, who got married as soon as I was finished university. She was still at university. We had a child fairly soon after that. and uh, But I thought, no, I really don't want to live in the bush. So. 
bit of a long story short, as they say, we came back to Sydney and I went back to that firm. It was a firm then called Sly and Russell. And I, after a few years, I was made a partner and after a few years, I was made sort of deputy managing partner. So I did well, that was a good firm, nice people. But I just wanted to be free. I wanted to do my own thing. So I went and worked for a client for a while, a startup company, and then I talked to Tony Tobin and I said we should why don't we start off a show in, in the town together? And that's what we did. You mentioned Sly and Russell, the precursor of which is now today Norton Rose yeah. Fulbright. You made partner at there at that firm at age thirty, and as you said, you met Tony at that firm, Tony Tobin. Talk to me about your friendship with Tony during those years. Well, look, we weren't. Uh, I wouldn't say that we were uh, close or intimate friends, but we had common values, and we both enjoyed a sense of restlessness and wanting to do something and we both figured out that we trusted each other and we enjoyed each other's company and we could do something together and um, that proved to be the case. What sort of areas of the law were you specialising in or practising? Well, at that point I was really doing uh, commercial work for technology companies and Tony was doing more mainstream work for corporates. And I was doing a bit of litigation as well. I was a bit of a jack of all trades, a bit of a generalist, good at, okay at many things, good at not many things probably, I don't know. <laughs> so Sly and Russell and then you went... So they were an old establishment firm dating back I think to about the 1860s. So they were pretty conservative. And I wanted to do things, I wanted to combine a life of professional practice and do something in the social justice area. And that was another reason that I wanted to do something on my own. I didn't think I'd be able to do that in an unfettered and free way at that firm. And what about that period when, uh, before you'd launched Gilbert and Tobin and after you'd left Sly and Russell, you were working, I think, for startups, you said, and technology companies. What sort of work were you doing for them? Basically technology licensing, acquisition work, that sort of thing. So I want to ask you about the launch of Gilbert and Tobin, January 1988. How did the partnership between you and Tony come together and, and what was the outcome? Oh, well, we, as I said, we talked about it for a year or two uh, before we did it. And we just, you know, we started with our own clients and we built from there. We got, had a big break uh, when we got involved in the litigation between Fairfax, Warwick Fairfax and local Martin Doherty and Laurie Connell and Alan Bond. It was a big, huge piece of litigation. We managed to get a bit of action about that. It was widely reported. And someone said that this firm that nobody's ever heard of seems to have a role in all of this. Uh, we have very few resources to be able to do it, but uh, yeah, that was good. And you know, at the end of the first year or after a little while, you start to think about what you've achieved and then you think about well we've done this why don't, why don't we see if we can take it to another level and we decided uh, we talked to a few other blokes that I'd known around the place one bloke called Peter Leonard who was at Sly and Russell with me a younger bloke and another bloke I'd met through the community legal centre movement called Peter Waters and we asked them what would they like to join us and we thought that uh, there was room to move into the telecommunication space, the market was about to deregulate and so we decided we'd build a division focusing on telecommunications and next thing you knew we were acting for Optus and then we decided we'd have a uh, media practice and we had to think about well who are the big media players that we might be able to act for in Australia. Uh, we didn't think there was much prospect of getting in bed with the Fairfaxes who owned the uh, Herald and that's those major newspapers, fairly establishment people and we didn't think we had any chance of doing any work for Murdoch but we thought we did have a chance with, we might be able to, you know, get some work out of Kerry Packer and so through various means we met the Packer interests and we brought other people in who had connections with those people and we started acting for the Packer interest and Channel 9 and that was a very successful thing for us to do for many years. And what was it like working with the Packers? Um, well it was pretty, it was sort of pretty interesting and there was never, you know, there was never a dull moment and uh, if you ever had uh, any dealings with Kerry he certainly uh, kept you on your toes. I didn't have a lot of dealings with him but I had a few over the years. 
I want to ask you about risks. You, you left an established practice and, and launched your own. Was there any concern in your mind that, you know, if this doesn't work out, what am I going to do? Oh, sure. We always had the view, both of us, that it didn't work out. We could go and get a job somewhere. We both had, you know, three, I think we each had three kids and uh, interest rates were around 18% at that time in the late 80s, early 90s. And so we, we wondered how well we, we might go, but uh, and it was fine. And uh, we just thought we'd be able to get a job, but we ne didn't need to. And then through the 90s, we sort of focused on the tech boom and the internet was just emerging and we rode that wave rather well. Was that deliberate to just focus on those sectors that were particularly hot at the time, media yes, and telecommunications? Well, media, telecommunications, while maintaining a sort of a corporate presence as well, so it wasn't too speculative. Then in about 2001, we decided that uh, we would maintain our technology and media practice, but we would broaden the scope and start to build <coughs> a corporate practice and sort of take on the establishment that had been around variously for 100 odd years or more and see if we could take some market share from them. That was quite a contested uh, opinion among the 10 or 12 partners that we had at that time. Some felt that we uh, had been successful in building this sort of media technology boutique and to sort of abandon that and try to build a corporate practice that people felt would be difficult and undifferentiated and what would be special about us that would enable us to build that, that, that was a considerable risk. I mean, I thought so as well, but given that, you know, over that past 10, 12 years, we'd been able to be pretty successful in what we've done, I thought it was worth the challenge to see if we could build a leading corporate practice presence in the country. And How'd you go about doing that? Largely through being pretty focused about what we wanted to do. We'd already had some corporate partners join us in the 90s, so we had a bit of a taste of all of that. And we decided uh, that we would just go out and see if we could target people who were young and ambitious and leading practitioners and making a way for themselves and uh, persuaded them to join us. I think we were a new a lot of energy, a lot of ambition, not hierarchical, fairly flat, uh, egalitarian kind of culture where people were free to pursue whatever it is they wanted to do within the scope of what we wanted to do. And we, you know, and we attracted a lot of people, but we'd started doing that prior to that point. We started doing that early in the 90s of uh, attracting talented people from the major firms. You know, people like John Williamson and Gina cascott Lieb, who's now head of the ACCC, joined us as a young lawyer and was a partner with us for 27 years. Mark O'Brien, I think. Mark O'Brien joined us for a number of years as well. He helped us uh, with the Packer relationship, as indeed, as indeed did Gina. So it was basically attracting other people into the firm, selling a bit of the vision to them, being financially successful, managing all of these disparate personalities keeping them all talking to each other and working together. Uh, and uh, you, we've had some ups and downs in all of that. It hasn't been perfect by any means, but uh, you know, if you keep your head down and you're resilient and you understand that the house is never built and you continue to imbibe and breed and make sure you inculcate through the firm this sort of sense of insurgency. We're doing something here, we've done this, we can do the, something better than this tomorrow and uh, just go from there. I think those sort of cultural imperatives are really important. And at the same time, you know, it's a business. You're not, uh, you're here to build a business and people are working hard and you need to be profitable. And I've always thought that you need to, to pay your people better than anybody else could be, pay them. That is your, your, your staff and your partners. And so you've got that ambition there and a determination to do that. And at the same time, I wanted to build a firm that could really take some pride in being an outstanding corporate citizen. And by that, for a lawyer, I guess that means you know, helping others establish. We were very early to start a pro bono practice in Australia, much earlier than most. I think nearly everybody, actually. And we, uh, at a very early point, we had a pro bono partners when others didn't. And we, uh, you know, we now have two and a half pro bono partners in the firm. 
So, and you know, to do things with universities like the Gilbert and Tobin Centre, the public law at the University of New South Wales, and uh, over that period, you know, uh, when we say two and a half, we're probably more than that because I've devoted a good deal of my life to uh, pro bono work. And why is that so important to you? Well, I think if you are privileged with whatever natural skills you've got, you know, you didn't go out and buy those, you just either are lucky to get them or not get them, be born with them. And uh, if you're then lucky enough to be admitted into a professional world that's not available to everybody, you know, you've got to meet certain requirements and once you meet those requirements, you know, you're, you're sort of given a, a fairly good guarantee base from which you can be successful. And uh, not everybody has that privilege or opportunity and I've always felt that if you're making money and you can make people's lives better, you ought to be able to do something there. And I think that building a corporate practice and acting for disadvantaged people uh, is not, are not mutually inconsistent, that you can do both of those things at the same time uh, quite comfortably. That was my view and the view of others who were working with me in the, in the 90s who joined me, me and Tony. And, uh, but today, of course, that's regarded as quite normative. Uh, and actually that, as people think about ESG, that corporate citizenship is, is uh, non-negotiable. That you've got to be thinking about uh, the broader community than just your own, your own self-interest. And, uh, and we've done that and we, and we continue to do that uh, through our pro bono practice and our various other activities that we engage in. I want to ask you about the, the trajectory of the firm. Two people in 1988, I think 950 plus staff now, about 90, 92 partners. So incredibly positive growth throughout the last 35 odd years. How have you managed to get to that level of, of success for the firm. You've taken market share away from players that, as you said, well, have been just, in the market. It's really thinking about what the future is all the time. Where is uh, the work going to come from? And, uh, you know, we're here to serve the interests of corporate Australia. And what are those needs? And where is there going to be interesting and demanding work uh, that's going to be highly profitable? And uh, you look at pockets of opportunity to uh, develop there and you either grow that capacity so we grow a lot of that capacity internally and where we think there's a deficit or a hole we need to fill we go out into the market and bring people in so that it's been a continuous process of building in that way and a preparedness to take risks to understand that we're going to do something a bit different here will it work or will it not work will these people we're bringing in Will they fit in? Won't they fit in? Will they be a success? And um, I've always, I've never been very cautious about that. Some people, particularly most law firms, oh, I don't know that we bring that person in. Will we get on with them? How will that work out? Will they fit in? I've never worried about that sort of thing. I've never looked over my shoulder and been too troubled about that because most people are good hearted and they want to come and have a go. And, but there have been plenty of people who have come for a little while and haven't lasted too long as well. This is not the place for them. Maybe we're too obsessive. Uh, you know, the work demands don't fit everybody. Uh, the uh, tempo doesn't fit everybody all of the time for a long time. Or people think that they want to do something a bit different. A lot of people have been to G&T and have gone into industry, gone and done other things as well. So it's been a good stepping stone for a lot of people. Fast tempo, hard work and above market remuneration, has that been a, a formula that's... A rest, I'd call it a restless ambition to do something, you know, and the house, I always say, it's a bit of a cliche, the house is never built. You can't stop to think that you uh, have been successful. I never think about that. I just think about what, what we've got to do tomorrow. And you can't, you can never kind of be smug or rest on your laurels or take anything for granted. You've just got to keep at it every day. And as I said, you've got to bring this kind of, you've got to think of yourself, it doesn't matter how successful you are. I think this is true in business as well. As a, as a new kid on the block, you've got to be a, something of an insurgent. 
What about building client relationships? You build, you build client relationships by doing terrific work. That's the best way. I mean, people have got difficult problems. They want solutions. They want transactions to be clear, complete in an effective, efficient way in litigation. Uh, you've got to communicate with people. You've got to produce lawyers who are understanding what they're doing, understanding what the client's wanting to achieve here, and communicating with them. And uh, that sounds all pretty easy, and, uh, but in the execution of that, it's not. Uh, not everybody is capable of doing that, but you have to deliver a first-rate service. You have to develop personal relationships we have with your clients. You have to understand that they're human beings just like you. They've got jobs to do. They've got somebody looking over their shoulder. If they stuff up, that'll impact them. So you've got to, you know, you're not just dealing with a corporation, you're dealing with individuals who've got their own lives and careers and you've got to connect with them as a person to person basis and understand who they are as well as what the company wants to achieve. So it's a, interpersonal skills uh, are incredibly important. You can have uh, the great technical and legal skills, and this is true everywhere, you know, are non-negotiable. They, uh, uh, they are a key to, the, to entry, really. You've got to have those. But after that, I think it's all about uh, your interpersonal skills and your capacity to understand other people and work alongside other people yeah. and help them sort of fulfil their dreams, I guess. What about managing the egos in a partnership group of 90-odd partners? How do you maintain that? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, basically, you have to uh, let people be. We've always run the firm on the basis that people, people can be who they are. Uh, and, you know, you have to, you know, you temper people's individuality to some extent, if uh, using your words about egos out of control. I think you can do that in how you conduct yourself as the leader of the firm and uh, try not to be that person, hope I'm not that person. So that has, uh, I think that has a trickle down impact. Other people see how you engage with other people and when I see uh, aberrant behaviour, I will generally, you know, I'll have something to say about it. And everybody knows, everybody knows what it is to be a decent person. Everybody knows what it is to treat other people with respect. Everybody knows that you have to acknowledge the individuality of the other person, that you have to be able to, that everybody comes to work because the organisation has made a decision that that person has a valuable role to play in the firm. It doesn't matter what it is that they do, and that has to be respected. So you just keep talking, I just keep talking about these things and making sure that, you know, it's in, it's in the cultural mix of the firm, the cultural vibe of the firm. But it zigzags, you know, some days, some over periods you'll feel that you're doing okay there and other times you'll think, oh, it's not so good now and you've got to have conversations with people and rain. You've got to be ever vigilant is what I would say about what it is to be a decent person. Biggest challenges along the way, what have they been? Oh, well, um, developing the focus for the firm, working out what we're, what's in and what's out has been an iterative process. I wasn't at all disciplined about that in the early years. I've learned that discipline and that focus over the years. So getting all of that right um, has been, and then bringing, you know, then you've got to bring people with you. People that come to the firm come because they think they can do something a bit different here and they can be sort of a more fully human and what it is they want to do. And But when you get a diverse mix of people, you've got to build a sense that they want to follow you that they think that they can trust you as a leader, that you're going to look after their interests and not your own, and the interests of the organisation and build that sense of trust, if that answers your question. Absolutely. And you've got to keep working on that and you can't ever stop working on that. Before we move on, you mentioned that the firm follows and chases work based on sort of the market conditions, the prevailing market conditions over the next 10 or 15 years, where do you see the market heading and therefore how will you position the firm? Well, there's this enormous change going on through climate, of course, decarbonisation. So I often think about it in this way for a professional services firm like ours. Sort of our role is to follow where the best capital is going to go. And uh, so you've got a role as a lawyer, I guess, of defending capital and uh, following capital. So that's how I like to think about it. 
And uh, look, there are going to be new industries develop. You know, we're just hearing people are looking with some kind of shock, I don't know why, about chat GPT. I mean, I've been talking about driverless M&A for about 10 years that it would come. It just took longer than I thought. And it's still not here yet, but there will be. That's what it will be like. And there will be new industries develop around technology. Uh, there'll be new industrial centres. And uh, we need to be in the forefront of what those new industries at the front, you know, those new frontier industries are going to be coming up every if we get the right incentives in this country to attract the right, keep and attract the right people and build the, uh, the economy of the future. I think uh, it's going to be quite different than what it has been. And the impact of technology is going to be profound. The whole future of work is still an unresolved issue. There are lots of interesting challenges. And I'm not too worried and I try to tell the young lawyers they shouldn't be too worried about this. The experience has always been that with technologies there are new opportunities. You just need to think about them and grasp those opportunities. Let's talk about some of your other interests. You sat on the board of NAB for 12 years during 2004 to 2016. What did you learn from your time on? Oh look, I learned a lot about uh, how big corporates work. I learned a lot about how boards work. I learned a lot about how you've got to build a sense of purpose and collegiality on boards. I learned the difficulties of being a board member of a very large com company and ever really knowing what's going on sort of down below and a lot of that was revealed in the, in the Royal Commission after I'd left and uh, I looked back and I thought well we probably could have we could have penetrated more deeply into some of those issues um, and I also learned you know the the real value that large corporations have in this country that's not well understood the number of people they employed their key role in the economy and uh, their role as a stabilizing impact on the company on the country provision of jobs and uh, so fundamentally important for the future growth and development of the nation and of the st standard of living of people in this country so it gave me a deep insight to those matters. Some people want to demonise or criticise people who work in the corporate space. They're good people. You know, they're out there trying to do their best in complex, in a complex environment as well. Feeds nicely into your board position at the Business Council of Australia, which you joined in 2019. There's been criticism for years and years, as you know, of the BCA. How are you seeing that that organisation is, is functioning these days? Is it hard enough on, on reform and the big issues? Well, I, you see, the view I have about that is that the BCA has been very active in reform about the challenges of the economy and the reforms it may need to make. And it gets listened to and what's not understood is that it is influential. It's not always revealed and acknowledged, but it's influential. Um, we would like to be more influential than we have been around the reforms that need to be made to the economy, but I, I think it's... Uh, an incredible organisation and a great privilege to be on a board like that and to work with the talent that's there. The Menzies School of Research, you're an honorary ambassador there. What sort of work does that institute do? Oh, well, I haven't been close to that, um, but I, my interest there was with working, uh, the, an organisation working with the, uh, some of the chronic health problems that are um, in the Northern Territory right across Northern Australia. Uh, renal failure, you know, respiratory kid problems that kids have. So it's a terrific organisation and I had a lot to do with them actually when I did that report for Woolworths a couple of years ago now into whether they should proceed uh, to build this large Dan Murphy outlet in Darwin. Uh, the problems of alcohol consumption right across northern Australia are uh, issues that this country has absolutely fail to deal with in any, in, in any adequate way and uh, causes destruction um, in the lives of kids, women, men themselves every day. As we sit here today, there's bad stuff happening up there and uh, we just don't seem capable of coming to terms with these sorts of things. That's why we need a voice. Let's talk about the voice. You're a big aficionado of it and a big ambassador for the yes vote. Why are you so passionate about that? Well, you know, I, 
when I said I wanted to build a firm which would allow me to do things in social justice, um, at the time I started the firm I was already involved with the Aboriginal community of Redfern and it sort of grew from there and I saw, you know, in the late 80s things were pretty, you know, in the, in the, right throughout the 80s, I think Redfern was still a pretty tough place there and uh, there was a lot of uh, Aboriginal gummies, street people, drug addicts, alcoholics. And, you know, I understood that they'd come from regional Australia and arrived in the inner city of Sydney uh, with little opportunity, a lot of social problems, uh, kind of a displaced people um, in many ways. And I kind of decided that, well, this is something that I think I can do and uh, make myself a friend of Aboriginal people and do what I can to bring them to the table of opportunity. That won't happen in my lifetime, but uh, it's important. It's very important work. And it was through meeting the local people there, had a lot to do with the late Shirley Smith, Mum Shirley, as she was known, and uh, with the Catholic priest there, Father Ted Kennedy. And uh, through those people, I met uh, other Indigenous leaders across the country, people like Patrick Dodson and Peter Yu and Noel Pearson, and I've uh, worked closely with Noel now for 20 years. I co-chair uh, his organisation. I mean, he's a, you know, a very significant person, leader, intellectual in, in Australia, full stop, but has been an incredible contributor to our thinking about the position of Aboriginal people and the terrible impact of the welfare system on Aboriginal people. And uh, I'm completely with him in his thinking on that. And uh, then we had the Uluru Statement from the Heart and I got obviously involved in what all that was about and the need for Indigenous people to have some, to be better listened to than they have been. You know, in every state and territory there is a Minister for Indigenous Affairs and a bureaucracy making decisions that impact their lives. There are no other people in Australia, no other group in Australia, of whom that could be said. And the uh, disadvantage that they suffer is profound. And they, one of the problems, if you think about the way this country treated Indigenous people from 1788, it's really, it's really a pretty shocking story that's not well known surprisingly not well known, or not well known as it should be, and uh, it's time to try to turn these things around. And in 1901, when the Constitution was established, Indigenous people were recognised by way of exclusion. Effectively, they were not to be counted as the citizens of the country. And what they are now asking for is some recognition. So it's about recognition of the First Peoples of this country and it's about giving them an opportunity to be listened to in the policies and laws that are rolled out that impact their lives. So it's the opportunity to build uh, informed decision making from the bottom up rather than what we've been used to in completely top down. You know we ignored them, we pushed them onto missions and then in the 1960s and 70s uh, we developed a, uh, I suppose, motivated by sort of the left thinking about all thing. We built this sort of social welfare. We drump, dropped them all into this social welfare net without any thought as to adequate education, uh, economic opportunities and the like. And, and those things have to change. And the, uh, I think the voice is an opportunity for that to change. And it's just a simple message. We don't need to, all the noise that there is about the Prime Minister's words now, we need to forget all of that. I think they're more than safe enough for us to go ahead. They make sense. It's only that, and all that they're asking for is to be listened to. You know, we may make, may make representations and uh, it's a kind of a, it's a, it gives them a guaranteed right to be heard. What the government, what the executive does about that is another thing, but it gives them some kind of seat at the table that they don't have today. And it's, it's just a fair thing to do after all this time, is to give them a better chance to participate in the um, table of opportunity in this country. 
And for corporate Australia, if they're not already on board, why should they can get on board? Well, corporates, you know, corporates are citizens. They are a legal entity in this country, and they are citizens. And particularly large corporates, but not only large corporates, they have a profound influence on the way we think about our country, on how the country operates. They many of them employ very large, have very large workforces, and uh, uh, they have. I think, the obligation to think about what are the best interests of this country and what, is, what are the conditions that will give a, the fairest opportunity to all citizens. And it's in their economic interests, actually, that they live in a stable, unified country. It's not in their interests uh, to live in a country where uh, there are disadvantaged groups who aren't being given a fair go. And so I think they have a real material interest in their own self-interest in participating in this, in this debate, but not everybody would agree with what I'm now going to say, but I, I think they have an obligation to. And so it is absolutely material and, and that they have something materially relevant for them to have something to say in this space. And I just reject the view that they should stick to their own knitting and have nothing to say about. Uh, issues that impact that impact the social infrastructure of this country. Good answer. A couple of quick questions to finish. How has the legal industry changed over the past three decades, in your view? Um, well, many more women around. Uh, when I started in the profession, it was all white blokes, and uh, so there are many more women around uh, from diversified communities. The profession much more closely represents the community. Uh, that it serves, which it should, so that's a good thing. Uh, technology has had a big impact. Some of the stuffiness has gone out of the profession. I, I hope that today it's not such an elevated thing, that it's a, it's a more ordinary. I mean, many people have got members of their families who are solicitors and, you know, we're providing a service. We don't have this elevated status in the community. Uh, I think a lot of the uh, formalities uh, are broken down. And that's a more, I think that the legal profession is uh, more accessible to the general population than it once was. Mind you, there's still the question of cost. But, and uh, I think it continues to service the nation pretty well. What does it take to be successful, do you think? Well, I think you've got to have a bit of ambition and uh, you've got to be clear about what it is you want to do. Uh, you've got to be prepared to work hard and you have to make choices about what you're going to do and what you, what you don't want to do. Uh, I think it's more about uh, resilience, ambition, focus and uh, an ability to live in a world of ambiguity, not knowing what the next question is, let alone the next answer to the question is, but having a really a strong sense of self-belief that you can achieve something, but you have to want to do that in the first place. So it's a, an amalgam of all of those things and anybody who can bring those things together, it doesn't matter in what field you work, whether you're working in a cafe that you might have been working in for 10 years or something, you know, those people are as successful as anyone and uh, I think you've got to uh, think of it in that way and, you sh and success should not be looked at through a narrow lens of what might typically be thought of success. I mean, people live successful lives across a whole spectrum of activity that might not be regarded as having the kind of success that I've had. But uh, so I was thinking anything you've got to be ambitious, you want to be, achieve something for yourself and you want to make a difference. What are the key lessons that you've learnt? Well, I, I think I've learned those things. I think I've learned that uh, those personal attributes are at the end of the day more important than your natural intelligence and skills. I'd say that and I've got a really strong belief that you know Australia is an egalitarian country and the right conditions people can do just about whatever they put their mind their mind to so I, I've learned that and I've learned that one should never uh, put a ceiling on oneself I mean I couldn't imagine as a uh, kid growing up in was place where I grew up was called Warrawidgee. Nobody said, you never heard of Warrawidgee, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was just an area, it wasn't a town or anything, that I would have been, you know, mixing with prime ministers and 
you know, there's pretty well nobody in the country that I can't pick the phone up to and have a conversation with who won't take my call. You know, you know, you never imagined that those things would be available to you. And so I think people ought to, young people ought to face into the world and think that. But I didn't think that, but it only became apparent to me in much, so I got much, much older. So that's the thing that I learned. I just wish I'd learned it earlier. <laughs> so I'd say to everybody, that's what you should think, because that's the case. You've met some incredible business people and people in, from all walks of life, politicians you mentioned there, Alan Bond, Kerry Packer, you know, Prime Ministers of both political persuasions. Who are the most impressive people that you've met or, or who's, any, who's somebody that stands out? Oh, well, in the political space, I suppose you'd have to name Keating, really, wouldn't you, Paul Keating? Uh, I think he will. History will judge him very well. He was a forward-thinking man, so I would sort of name him. Um, and there's many people, good people, who contribute in enormous ways, people in the public sector, people in commercial life who contribute to the strength of this country. There's a lot of them. Final question, what's next for you and what's next for the firm here? Well, we'll continue to grow the firm. Um, we will continue to, you know, we need to face into what I'm calling, what I've said in this interview is the frontier economy. How are we going to be uh, fit for purpose to do all that? We need to continue to attract the best talent into the firm. Uh, we need to nurture them and develop them in different ways. Like when I was a young lawyer, nurture? What does that mean? <laughs> no such thing. You were just sort of thrown into the deep end. So I'm a bit of a throw you in the deep end person, but I've been told to I have to reform those ways of thinking and I've tried to do that. Some would say that I've completely failed, that I'm still throw you in the deep end person. I think I probably am, but you know, young people want something more and they want to work for firms that stand for things. And uh, they want, to, I think, the values of the organisation. So, um, you know, I think luckily the values we have in this firm are very very consistent, concordant with their own values. So you've got to keep thinking about those things, uh, attracting the right people, making sure it's the kind of culture where a thousand flowers can bloom and people feel recognised and valued. You've got to keep doing that. And you've got to, we, we will continue to think about where the capital is going to go, where is the smart capital going to be invested, what are going to be the new industries, how's technology going to infiltrate that and be an important part of that and make sure that we've got the skills and capacity to meet all of those challenges. Danny Gilbert, AM, pleasure having you on the program. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Rob. Thank you.